Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to our webinar on automating business data exchange, where we will explore a no-code approach to data integration. My name is Mike Mahan, and joining me today is Eugene King, one of our senior application engineers. Uh, Eugene has over 30 years' experience with Lansa on the IBM I and uh, Windows platforms, and is the perfect guide for today's journey. Our agenda today will start with setting the stage with three questions, some terminology, and core components. We will then jump immediately into a demonstration highlighting key areas of the process. We'll focus on an EDI use case uh, for the demonstration, but we'll be happy to show the other use case examples, or perhaps one unique to your business at your convenience. We will finish with a question and answer session, so please enter your questions in the chat during the presentation, and we will capture that. We will uh, cover those at the end. Uh, presentation should take about uh, 40 minutes, 10 minute demo, so leaving about 10 minutes for Q and A at the end. Uh, at this point, I would like to pass the baton to Eugene to take us through our data exchange approach. Eugene. Okay, thank you, Mike. So. While I'm going through the presentation, I want you to think of three questions. So the first being, how much effort does it currently take to handle new data requirements in or out of your organization, as well as between your internal applications? How much programming effort? What happens when you get a new trading partner? Keep that in mind as we go through. The next question is, well, what happens if something goes wrong? How can you recover from that? What happens? Can you keep the process going, or have you got to start over again? Have you got to do some remedial work? So think about that as well. And the final question to think about is, well, how do you monitor the performance and the status of your overall system? Also, how do you keep track of any documents that you actually receive from your trading partners, whether that's internal or out external? Now, Lancer Composer will address all of these specific areas. So when we look at business process integration, there are four main areas that we really need to address. The first is getting the data. So how do we move the data? It's all about the transportation. We need to get it from point A to point B, whether that's internal or external. Once we have the data, what do we do with it? How do we make it useful for ourselves? Or if we're pushing the data out, what format do we need to put it in for our trading partners? How do we bring it all together? Traditionally, this has been a programming, uh, a programming exercise, but how can we take all of these processes, the receiving of the data, the transforming of the data? Well, we need to coordinate those activities. We need a process orchestration. And finally, how do we administer it? How do we control user access? How do we handle things when, when something goes wrong? How do we send alerts? And all four of these are actually addressed via Lanza Compose, and we'll see each of these in turn with a demo as we go through the presentation. But before I do that, just a little bit of terminology that I'm going to be using as part of the presentation. The first is trading partner. So trading partner essentially is, well, it could be external, a customer, or internal, an internal system. And each trading partner, we can define specific message types. Now, these message types can be things like your traditional EDI, which is your orders, dispatch confirmation, invoices and credit notes. It could be that it's an account inquiry. It could be that it's, it's something else. Yep. So it can be anything you want, but it's a specific message type. The format is, well, what format is that message received in? Is it JSON? Is it XML? Is it the Eddy Factor X12? Is it a CSV? How often do you want to receive that? And finally, the transport. How do you get it from your trading partner? And with that, we have our configurations. So we'll see more of trading partners later on in the presentation. But then we've got configurations. Now, pre configurations are a predefined set of parameters that we use to derive uh, to drive our activities. 
So when we look at Composer and we look at our process, we essentially break down the process into individual steps. And you'll see examples of this when we look at the main use case and then some of the example use cases we have at the end of the presentation. But it can be as simple as rename a file or get the data using FTP or log a variable for a, uh, for a user message. So it's essentially we break it down into individual steps. And then we take each of those activities, each of those steps, and we glue them together. And we call this the process orchestration. And you'll see again this during the demonstration. Let's go back to those four components. So we're going to look at first at the transport. So how do we move the data? Now, the transport is an example of an activity. Yeah, so it's just one of the many activities that we have. And I'll show you in a second the different ones that, we, that come with the actual product. So when we look at the transport activity, it's all about getting the data from our training partner. Again, that's internal or external. And how do we get that? Are we using FTP? Are we using HTTP or web services of some sort? Do you want to use email or message brokers? So whether it's Java message services or an MQ message queue, then we can actually access those. And if you've got something specific to your organization, that's fine, because we've made, the, made Composer extensible so that you're able to add your own activities, not just transport, but across the board, any type of activity. It's just a 3GL program that we can wrap her up and we can make it known to Composer and you can use it. So you can extend that functionality. So let's take a look at that with Inside Lanza Composer. So this is the Composer Workbench. So I've got everything installed on my desktop. So I'm using a Microsoft SQL local database. I'm using Microsoft IIS on, on the system as well. And I've got my Composer system installed. So here we've got all our different options. But I want to just focus on the activities for now. So if I just go into the activities, we see a list of the, the recent ones I've been looking at. But if I go at activities by group, you can see the different types of activities that we have. So do you want to use email, file management, processing, spool files for the IBM I? So how do you handle spool files? Transformations, variable manipulations, and zip file activities. So we've got many different types of activities. So I'm going to focus on the FTP. And I've already got it highlighted, the FTP inbound. And we can see the details of that activity. So this is a shipped activity. To drive that activity, we need a configuration. So we go into our parameters. In the parameters, we can see the only one that I really require is the actual configuration part. And for that, if I go to configuration section here, highlight that, we can see I've already got it open, LCD FTP in. That's one of my configurations with a description and a status. So this is inbound. The remote host I'm going to connect to, the remote user and their password, and then which directories and what specific files I want to retrieve. So this is my configuration. I'm going to use that to drive my activity. And I've got an option to test. So I can just run that, bring that across onto this console, and we can see that my testing is has worked so I, i've actually successfully connected so i'm able to use my ftp activity now with inside a process so this is where i would set that up so that's examples of the activities so that is the transport so they're the different types of transports we have now let's look at how we can change the data so this is the second part of that circle so how do we transform that data? So when I'm talking about transforming, I'm talking about taking different file types or different da data in different formats and being able to manipulate it into a useful format for our organization. So I may receive it in a CSV format, but I need to write it to a database. I communicate between two different databases and set in kit. In fact, one of the use cases at the end, I have an example of where we're just writing and enhancing data from one database to another database. We can handle traditional EDI, 
So whether you're X, uh, X12, Tradacoms, or one, or one of the many other types of EDI formats, we can support those. Are you using XML or JSON? We can handle those different formats as well. But it's all about getting the data into a format which, you, which your organization can use. So for example, changing dates or changing and using lookups to get the correct product codes based on what the trading partners actually sent you. Or we can enrich the data as well. And again, one of the use cases at the end of the demonstration will actually uh, look at how we can enrich the data using the, the, the transformations. So how do we do this? What does it actually look like? Let me go back to my Composer Workbench again. Now for this one, I'm going to go into my transformation maps. So the one I'm going to be looking at is this one here. So this is a partial map. So this is an inbound order for an XML writing to a database. I'm going to edit mode. That will open up my mapping software. So here is where we work with our trans data transformations. We have our source, which in this case is an XML document. And we have our target, which in this case is a database. This one is residing locally on my SQL server. Now I need to add some more things to this. So it's not a complete map. So the first thing I want to do is add a batch number. But the batch number is going to provide it externally. So I need to define an input. So we insert an input. What is that one? I'm just going to call that one batch number. I'm going to keep that as string. I can specify a test value. We say OK. So now what I've defined is an input for the map, that input being the batch number. So my process can pass information into the actual map. I also need to do a calculation. So on the left-hand side, we see a library of all the different types of calculations that we can do and string manipulations. Think of Excel, the sort of functions you can do in Excel. So I want to look for multiply. So I type in multiply at the bottom, and I have my multiply here. So in this case, I want to just do a simple calculation. I want to do price multiplied by quantity gives me my line value. And I can test the output. So this is what the output will actually come through. Go back to my map, I can now save that. I've now done, completed the mapping portion. So this will take the XML and parse it into the database. I can close that map down now. So once I've finished with that, I can just prepare it and go prepare. That will generate the actual map for me to use as part of my process. So we'll do some final calculations, do complete, and then just catalog and we're done. I'll just say start for that one and close that down. So that map is now ready to use. Okay, so where would I use that map? This is where we come on to the process orchestration on how we can coordinate the activities. So when we're talking about orchestration, we're talking about breaking down a process into simple step-by-step separate set of instructions. We can make that process more flexible by using trading partners. And again, we'll see some of that later on uh, on that part of the demonstration. We can do conditional processing. So depending on what we've received, we can then decide, well, actually, I'm going to call that process, or I'm going to call this other process. So one example that I had was, well, if it's an image, I want it moved into a directory. But if it's an XML file, I want to parse it. Yep, so we can do that sort of conditional parsing. We can do parallel processing. So if we've got a, a process that has got, let's say, 200 orders that we need to process, we might want to break that down into, into groups of 10 so we can submit them all together, which would speed up the overall processing. So we can do that. We can set it up so we can submit multiple times the same process. Any error handling can be put into our process. Yeah, so we can detect if we've got a problem with the FTP connection 
or if we've got a problem with the, with the transformation. We can flag that up and we can send out a message to the technical team to say there's been a problem with this process. And it's all about automating this whole process. So on my Windows environment, I use Windows Tasks Manager to schedule my uh, processes to run on a regular basis. If you're using an IBM I, you can use whatever scheduling software you use on, on, on an IBM I. It's up to you on how you actually do that. So let's take a particular example. Again, sticking with the orders, sticking with an order XML. Let's break it down into its constituent parts. So the first thing to do is to get the XML document from the trading partner's website using an FTP. Once we have it locally, we'll need to generate a batch number. So you can do it inside the process, and that's what I'm doing in this example I'm going to show you in a second. Or what you can do is call another program. So if your system already generates a reference number or a batch number or an order number, we can call that and retrieve that and use that as part of our process. Once we've done that, we can populate our transformation, uh, we can populate our staging files. So in a typical ERP system, they don't allow you to write orders directly into the system itself. You have to write it into a staging file, which is what we're doing here. So we take the XML and we transform it and put it into local database. Once we've done that, we can call the ERP's program to then process those orders. And we just repeat the whole process. And this is what it looks like inside Composer. So now we're in Composer again, and I'm going to the processing sequences. So the one I want to use here is this one, LCD orders in 01. I just double click and edit. We now have the whole process. So if, we rem if you remember the diagram, there's my FTP, and I'm using the LCD FTP in configuration. If I needed to use another configuration, I could just do the chevrons and select it from there. Once we've got the list of orders, we're going to loop through them. Yep, so the FTP inbound, this here is the list of files retrieved with a full path and file name. We're going to loop through that and assign each individual one this order. Okay, once we've done that, we calculate a batch number. So we're essentially we're doing creating a variable here and then generating a number and then just substituting it in. And that gives me my batch number, this batch. Right, now we need the transformation. Okay, let's explain a little bit of what's on the left-hand side. Here is my directives palette. So from here, is think of it as drag and drop programming. Yeah, you don't need to know a lot about programming for this, but you do need to have some appreciation. And all I need to do is essentially, let's say, for example, if I want to do a a, a cat on the um, FTP to make sure that if there is an error, I can catch that, and then I can decide what to actually do with that. So when we do that, let's see, I can say, okay, just ignore the error. Yep. Or I can say, well, actually flag it up as an error, and then I can terminate the activity. So I'm going to use the chevrons there just to do a little bit of manipulation. There we go. So if there's an error, I'm just going to stop the process from running. I need the transformation. So I've not put the transformation in yet. So again, I'm going to go back to the left-hand side, and we're going to look at our transformations here. And we've got it defined by type. So I'm looking for an inbound order, and I'm going to use this one here, and just drag and drop that onto the, onto the screen there. Again, I'm going to move it down using my arrow keys at the top. And then I just need to specify these particular parameters. So where is the file that I'm going to be using? What is the batch number? and then the database connection that I want to use. So let's go through this. The file name. And we go again to the left-hand side and select variables. The file name I want will be 
this order in, yeah, which is that one that I've defined there. Then the so the batch number. Uh, let me just check to see which one I'm going to be using. Is this batch? So onto the that one, and go this batch. So I can drop that one on. Let me just change that one again. Put the ampersand on that one. Okay. And then finally, the database connection. Well, again, I can use the chevrons here and say, which one do I want to use? Well, I'm going to use LCD orders in. That's the configuration for the database connection. So it's a similar, it's an activity again, or it's a configuration that connects to the local database. And that's it. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to save that one. And I'm going to run. Now, if I've put done everything correctly, so I can submit it to back, or I can run immediately. I'm going to run it immediately. If I've done everything correctly, you'll see now that we've got a log detailing everything that's been done, the next batch number, where we, what we've transformed. So we've taken that XML file, and we've successfully transformed it. And that would have written it to the local database. If I add an error on that, then I would be able to drill down and see more details on the actual error itself. So that is a simple process, but in real life, it's not just a one-to-one. -one. So the one I showed you was an XML document, but it could be that you have multiple trading partners, each of them sending a document in a different format. So one could be sending traditional EDI like Edifact or X12. Another could be sending an Excel spreadsheet, another text, not to mention internal systems that might want to go from database to database. So you have to be able to do all of these different types of integrations. And to allow us to make that process you saw as flexible as possible, you, know, you could just write a simple process for every one of your trading partners, but you may just want to create one single process that covers all the trading partners. And to do that, we have these trading partners. And I'll show you that in a second in the actual console, how we set that up. But it means that we can soft code all the connections to the servers. So one trading partner might use FTP. Another may use HTTP. Another may send it via email. So you'd need to use POP3. It doesn't matter. We can soft code those connections. Likewise, the transformation maps. So we can set up a specific type of map and assign it to that trading partner. So one the sending XML will use one map. The other sending an Excel spreadsheet would use another map. And we want to keep the directory separate so we can monitor the documents that are inbound and any that go in error. And then we want to repeat it for every one of our trading partners. So let's have a look at trading partners. Again, to the console, selecting trading partners this time. And here we have a selection of different trading partners. Let me just select one of them, double click, and that, and give myself a little bit more room. So here is a trading partner, LCD Alpha. We have all the description. Now, for these ones, everything that you see here is accessible in a process. So we can access the email addresses, we can access the address information, and even the company name and status. We can assign it to a group. So in this case, LCD Alpha is part of the uh, Lanza Composer demo group. We can link directories. So everything that I receive from Alpha will be written to their specific directories. I've got inbound and outbound directories. When I create a trading partner, it automatically creates those for me. I don't have to do anything, just indicate that I want them. We have linked maps. So in this case, we have a map type of inbound order, and I'm going to be using LCD orders in. We've got inbound orders IBMI, and we're going to use a different map. So these are the map types, and they're important because they will change. That doesn't change. What changes 
is the map ID that I'm going to be using. Same with the LinkedIn com configurations. So in this case, for the FTP, I'm using LCD Alpha. For Beta, I'm using the Beta configuration. So I'm looking in a different set of directories. I could be looking on a different FTP server. It doesn't really matter. So it allows me to set those up. So at runtime, let me show you what that actually looks like. So I'm going to go to my processing sequences again, and I'm going to open up this process, which is covers all my training partners. So there's a slight difference now in that everything is soft coded that I'm using. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm looping through the trading partners. That's what this is here. So the star trading partners is an inbound is a list of all my trading partners. I'm checking the group ID for that trade a uh, specific trading partner. If they're part of the LCD group, then I'm going to do FTP inbound. Let me give myself some room at the bottom, get rid of those, and increase the parameters. So inbound FTP configuration, I'm using the trading partner specific connection. I'm also using the local directory for that trading partner. Yep, so I've now soft coded that. We go down to the transformation. The transformation is soft coded again. So it's transformation map inbound orders. So now it'll run this map for the specific user. And then do a little bit more manipulation, move the file, and then if I need to it's currently grayed out, but I could call another lens of, uh, call a function there to process the orders like I did in the previous one. So that one, I can then go run, execute again immediately, and that will tick off. And in this case, it's gone through, and it's gone through each of those trading partners. Yep, so you can see alpha here. As soon as we expand alpha, we can see the exact same process. Yep, so it's gone through the other trading partners. They're not part of the group. Therefore, I am going to start using these ones here. Okay, I'm going to start processing the orders for that. So in that way, I can take a single process, and I can run it for each individual trading partner. If I need to add a new trading partner, all I need to do is create the trading partner, and I'll add a new one, create the FTP configuration, and create the new map. Once I've done that, I can run, I can just add it to the group and it will then include it. So it can be very quick once you need to do some new development on that side. Okay, so that is the uh, trading partners. So the final segment was management. How do we manage the whole process? How do we control the user access? We can set up multi-tier logging so that I can have user error logging or user messages, but I also can go down to the technical level for your IT team to investigate any specific issues. So I've got it set up that if it completes okay, don't do any additional logging. But if there is an error, I want full technical logging on it. So you've got that option to do that. You also have an option where I put the trap error and then terminate the process, you could just stop the process there and then get somebody to actually check it. You know, you can automatically notify somebody that the FTP server is down, for example, and that you can't connect. They can log in, reestablish, the, make sure the connection is there or the FTP service is back up again. And then you can go back to your process and you just restart that process from the point of failure. Again, it's really up to you on how you configure that. Everything is fully audit, audited. So if I make a change to a map, the person who made the change is logged. If I make a change to a process, we also have version history as well. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And we've got dashboards that are available over the browser. Yep, so you don't have to be running the console. You can have your mobile phone or your tablet on you, and you can look at the actual overall performance. So with regards to user access, this is about what users can do when they log in to Lanza Composer. So it could be, for example, you have 
development system and you have a production system and you don't want anybody to be able to edit maps or processes or change processes in the live system, then you can set that up so that, it, that nobody can do that. On the dev system, you can allow them to do anything. And then we do have a we do have a facility included in Composer that allows you to package everything up and export it into the production system. So we've got that all handled in the background. So it's very easy to deploy your maps and your processes. We have a process monitor so we can see what's going on, what processes have been run, any of them that had an error status, any of them that are currently active. We can see the run times through this. Yeah, so we can see the first one started at 8.51.50 and the second one, and it ended at 8.51.57. Yeah, so we can see here at a glance if there's been any specific problems. And again, you can filter that just to view anything in error, or you can just say, well, actually, I just want to see everything. Double click on a process, and again, like you saw previously, you see the log. Yeah, so you'll be able to see the log of everything that's actually gone on. And if there is an error, you'll automatically get notified. You can set up system alerts, and you can set up your own alerts. So we've got a number that, uh, of alerts that are automatically built in, things like if a transformation map fails, if a process fails, or if an FTP fails. We've already got that built in. But if you want your own alert, alerts, you can set those up, and then you can email them um, e email those alerts to your technical team and it'll include a link and that link will actually show you the log so you can see where exactly that error is. And I mentioned the um, versioning so for maps and for processing sequences we have versioning so if you I've made a mistake. So you, you've made a change to the process, you've tested it and it doesn't work, but you can't figure out where the error is. You've got an option to roll back to a previous version. And you can do where that is mainly used, or I've mainly used it with maps, because maps can become quite complex, especially when you're dealing with your traditional EDIs like your X12s, your Tradicoms, and your, and your Edifact. So it becomes really hard. So it's better to be able to go, well, actually, I know this version works. I'm going to roll back to, to, to that actual version. So it gives you that flexibility. So if you've made a mistake, you just roll it back. The web-based monitoring. So again, this is a responsive web application. So you can run it on mobile phones and uh, tablets. But it gives you an overview of the performance. So if you've got something that's taken a long time to run, you can flag it up. You can flag it up here. You'll be able to see what the process is, what length it takes. So you can see here we've run today 21. Average complete time is 21 seconds uh, or 21 milliseconds, I should say. So these this is actually in milliseconds. Uh, the maximum time is 41 milliseconds and uh, minimum time is 6 milliseconds. So you can see that it's being run. If you add something that was taking a long time, you can drill down and you can see which process is taking you a long time. And you might want to do something like, well, actually, that's taken 30 minutes because I've got a lot of documents to process. Let's split it down into runs of 10, uh, runs of 10 uh, using the parallel processing. And you'll see the, the speed actually go down. You've got access to the logs, so you can run specific processes on the uh, uh, from the web console and you can see all the logs on the web console so you don't need to be logged in to the actual workbench for that and I mentioned mobile apps it is a responsive app so you can see the breakdown of what processes have been run and how long those processes have been run directly on your mobile devices well that's um, that's that particular example there, looking at the management side. Now, what I want to do is look at some other use cases. Now, as Mike mentioned at the beginning, we don't really have time to go into any detail with regards to these, so I'm not going to demo them. I'm just going to talk about what the use case is and how we've tackled that using Lanza Composer. 
And there will be many more different use cases. It's just not about EDI. You can, we have customers that use it for moving documents around the system. So documents come in, they go into a directory, and they automatically, based on the document type, move it into a specific area uh, or a specific directory for users to access. So the first use case is an automated email inquiry with a spreadsheet out. So what, are you, what do we mean by that? Well, let's say an organization wants to automate their customer inquiries. The customers will send an email, and that email will contain the inquiry type. Now we need to grab the email address, and that email address will identify the customer so that we can retrieve the customer information directly from the database, and we can send them an email back. Now if it's an account inquiry, we want to also send them their order history. So we want to send them a spreadsheet. So that's what we want to do. So let's, how would we break that down? So here's, this is what we would do. So first of all, we need to get the email. Yep, so we need to use the POP3 activity using that configuration that you see on the side to go and query the mailbox. We get the email and we check the request type. Now that could be in the subject or it could be in the body. Yeah, but we check the request type. Once we've determined what the request type is, then we can do this conditional processing, where we can say, well, if it's a product inquiry, I want to call this process. Or if it's an account inquiry, I'll call the other process. And then we repeat the whole thing again. Okay, so this is the master process. This is the main controlling process. So let's just drill down into one of the file processes, the, the account inquiry. So what does that look like? So the control process calls the, uh, the account inquiry process, and the first activity it does, it uses the email to call an SQL feature, so our SQL activity, to retrieve the account ID. So we've got the email associated with the account, we use an SQL activity to grab the account ID. Using the account ID, we can create, we create a temporary file to hold specific order information. And then we do the transformation. So we're going to grab, using the account ID, we're going to essentially pass it into our transformation map, use a where structure to essentially create an email. And then in this case, we're sending the email body so we can merge the account information, the account ID, all the information we've gathered from the account file into the uh, email, and we can then send that email off using an SMTP activity. So in this case, it's a mail send activity. And then it retreat, repeats the whole process. So that terminates that, and it goes then back to the master process and then the master process will take over again. So the actual process itself looks like this. So it goes in, so it's calling another processing, and this is the SQL activity. So this is using the email address to go and grab the account information and pull the account information back in again. The log variables are just examples of where we're logging specific pieces of information that the user may be interested in. We're then doing the transformation. So we're creating the order history file. So that's the map. The text substitution creates that, so it takes that email skeleton that you saw, merges in the account information, and then finally sends. And that's what the process looks like. The map is even simpler because I send the account information in. This that you see in the middle there is just a select. So in there, I've got a, a, little bit of a little bit of select SQL that says wherever the customer ID equals the account ID, I'm going to write it to my text file. In this case, it's a, C it's a CSV file. Yeah, so we've got the outbound CSV from, from the actual database table. So that's, that's that example and how we've actually initiated that with inside Composer. Now the next one, again, this is about documents rather than data transformation. It's all about sending documents securely 
via FTP. So an organization wants to be able to send PDFs, Word, Excel, any sort of document they need to send securely to their trading partners. So they want it in a zip file, and they want that zip file, Base64 encoded, and embedded in an XML document. And once that's done, we can FTP it onto a secure server. So what does that look like if we break it down into individual steps? So first of all, we use a direct a directory list activity. That'll grab all of the documents in the target directory. Once it's done that, it will compress them into a zip file. Yeah, so it creates the zip file. Then it does a simple base64 encoding. So we have an activity that is encodes it and also decodes it. So if you want to go the other way. So we can encode the file. We then embed that in an XML document. So we get a text string, an encoded text string, which we embed in, a, in an XML document which we then finally use FTP, SFTP, FTPS to securely send that to the actual trading partner. So what does that look like in Composer? So here's my process that I've orchestrated. Again, I'm using the trading partners, but this time I'm looking at trading partner who belongs to the document group. There's the directory list activity. We then zip it up. We then encode it, and we transform it, and finally, FTP, outbound. So exactly as you saw in that process outline, this is the steps that we've broken it down to. We do have an error, so I do, do have an error trap here that says if we have a problem encoding it, then I'm, I want an error to say unable to encode current document, and then gives you the document name that it's trying to, to encode. Okay, so I do have an error trap in that one. And the map, well, this is a little bit more complicated map because I'm using an XML envelope here, the message envelope. So what we have are inbound parameters. So our document name, our documents extensions, and the file name. So this is the name of the base encode, uh, the base64 encoded file. We're accessing a local database to grab some information where we need to send it. In this case, um, some additional elements on the uh, on the XML file. We're then using the text file. So that file that we see there, we're just using it as a means. So think of it as a, a second step to embed the base64 encoded string into the XML. Once we've done that, we're done. Okay. So that is that is that done. So then. Once we've got that document, we can then FTP that document. So that's that's the um, base64 encoding with secure FTP out. And the final one I want to look at um, that we've got time to look at is copy data from one database to another. A simple example in that our source database is a local MSQL, our target database is DB2400. And not all the columns or fields map directly. So a category code in X product is numerical, while on the IBMI, it's a three-character code. The product code on, uh, on the IBMI is made up of the category plus the product ID. So we, we need to do some data manipulation in the actual map, and we need to enhance that. So let's look at the process first. So we start a processing sequence. We log user information. So in this case, we're saying this process has now started. We then just simply transform, run the transformation to map the data. And then we send an email confirmation saying, oh, we're done. We're all done now. Yep, you can now go check the data on, uh, on your target system. The process follows the exact same thing. So we log information to say that it started and the date and time that it started. We do the transformation. So in this case, I'm running the transformation map to move the data from the local database to the remote database. And there, here's we've got our configurations, SL, uh, SLS, SQL Connect, 
an LCD IBM I connect, and there are two connection configurations that connect me to the appropriate databases. We, we capture the username so that we can create the email to send to the user. So this is the format that that email would actually take. The product data has been transformed from the file, X product in the Microsoft SQL database and moved into the file LTC prod in the IBM I database. Sincerely yours, Technical Services, Lanza Tool Company. And that's the process. We then send the email. And the map looks like this. So again, we're doing a little bit more now because we're doing some data manipulation. So we've got our source and we have our target. But to be able to get the source data into the correct format, we have these particular mapping elements where we can do some data manipulation. So in this one, we're essentially using a lookup table to look up the correct product ID and also creating the product ID. So this is what it actually looks like. So we've got the product category input and the product ID input. In this case, all we're doing is product ID, getting the first three characters out, and then using a value map. So this is a value map here. So I've got the, a lookup table that allows me to look up the product code numerical and assign it to a three character product code and put it into the new product code. And at the same time, I'm concatenating that together with the product ID to give me the product ID in the format that the target is required. And I do something similar for calculating the price, price break points. So in the source system, I don't have that, but I do on the target. So I need to take the price and just multiply it by the set amounts for, um, for the uh, price breaks. So that gives me that capability. Okay. So essentially, that concludes this portion of the actual demo. So just to reiterate what we've gone through. So Lanza Composer essentially gives you the ability to set up your transportation, to get your data from your target system, whether that is internal or external, you know, your trading partners. Once we get the data, we can format the, that data, we can enrich that data, we can add it and we can send emails, we can create CSV files from that. Yeah, we can do whatever we need to do to make that data useful to ourselves. We have this process orchestration tool that allows us to take the individual activities and put them together into a workflow. And we can step that through. And it becomes very easy to actually do. We can put error trapping in there. And we can put user logging in there. So it makes it very easy to coordinate those activities. And finally, we have some administration functionality that allows us to monitor what's going on to see if we've got any errors, to see if we've got any particular bottlenecks. So it allows us to see that. And we can also uh, control user access to, to the system to see whether they can edit maps or whether, whether they allow to change processes. So we have all of that built in to uh, Lanza Composer. So at that point, I would like to open the floor to any questions. Okay, Eugene, we did. Uh, so uh, for those of you on the, the call, uh, please enter your questions uh, in through the chat. Uh, we do have a couple, Eugene. Uh, during the, um, the, I think it was the management portion of your demonstration, uh, somebody asked, um, <laughs> the SMB configurations are limited to use of uh, SMB1. Is it possible to allow the use of SMB2 or 3 since SMB1 is deprecated by Microsoft? So that's the question. Yes. Yes, it is. Oh, easy answer. I like that. Yeah, it's an easy answer. As I mentioned, it's fairly open. And if we don't have some sort of configuration or connection, you can always create your own. Okay. Yep. Um, I had a question, can you call RESTful services um, at, at part or as, as part, probably, uh, of a business process? Uh, again, it's going to be a short answer, yes. You do have the ability to call RESTful web services part of the sequence. 
as okay. either part of the sequence or as part of the map. So yeah, you, you do have that ability. Okay. Um, we have had a question I can, uh, actually this is one I can answer, Eugene, so how, how about that? Uh, so can we get a copy of the presentation? Was a question. So um, again, uh, you will be you'll be getting a a, a link to a replay uh, of, of this. Um, so if any of you would would like a, a copy, of, like a hard copy of the presentation, um, send a note to your salesperson. If you don't know who your salesperson is, uh, you may send it to sales at lansa dot com uh, or to me, uh, Mike. Dot Mahan, that's M-A-H-A-N, like November, uh, at lansa.com. Uh, let's see. Um, so I'm uh, looking for a little more detail, I guess. What happens um, when there is a processing error? Okay. So, again, the error handling is built in to uh, Lansa Composer. So when an error occurs, um, you can flag that up. So again, it's up to you on how you actually handle that. You can decide to terminate the process and notify and send an alert out to your technical team to have a look at the error, or you can just set the error and then ignore the error and then come back to try later. A prime example of that is FTP. So it could be that the FTP server is down, and you want to try it again, say a couple of minutes later or a couple of minutes after that. So you might want to do that. You might want to put a delay in there if it's down, and then try again. You know, try three times. If it fails after the third time, send an error and continue processing. So it's really flexible on the way that you can deal with your errors. Okay, great. Um, so I had another request for the uh, the presentation. Um, so. We got Greg, Greg Davis. I'm just making notes here. Sorry. <laughs> and Carlo De Maria. So another question. Um, oh, good. Um, one of our customers. If I have Visual Lansa, um, are are these compatible? I guess meaning uh, Composer and Visual Lansa. Yes, absolutely. Well. Composer is written using Visual Lanza, so yes, it's they're fully compatible. You can have Lanza, co Lanza Composer call programs developed in Visual Lanza, whether that's web or Windows, and vice versa. Yeah, so you can execute VL apps as part of the Lanza Composer business process. Yeah, so in there we have a call activity, and that could be calling a Lanza program, or it could be calling a, a a .NET program, or it could be calling a Java program. It doesn't really matter, but we have an activity to cover that. So the simple answer to that one is yes, it is Visual Lanza. So yes, they are compatible. Perfect. Um, so that is uh, the last question. So I did did want to reiterate we we focused uh, the demonstration here on on EDI as an example. Tried to cover some other areas. Uh, as potential use cases, um, there there could be others. So if there's something in particular um, that you are you are interested in in trying to pursue, uh, given kind of the if you look at the over the generic overview of of how the tool actually operates, um, there's a lot of flexibility in the types of things and and, and the, the data that we can process. So. Um, please, uh, please reach out again. Sales at lansa.com or me directly, Mike.Mayhem at lansa.com, and uh, we'll get something set up specifically for you. So, thank you, everyone, for for joining the webinar, for taking the time, and uh, we we look forward to speaking with you in the future. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.